are visiting, my name is Arthur, I'm on the team here, and it's great to have you with us, and I just uh, ask that God just touches your heart today, and um, so why don't we pray to, to start with. We praise your name, Lord. Father, we praise you. Come, Spirit. And just as you still yourself before the Lord, no matter where you are in the journey of discovery of him, whether you're here and you're not even sure God exists, or whether you've just come to know him, or whether you've been in relationship with him for the last 40 years, God wants to take you another step forward. He wants to speak to your heart today, friend. You're not here by accident. You're not here because somebody dragged you along. You're here because God has a divine appointment with you today. Thank you, God. And just with your head bowed, why don't you just ask God to speak to you today? Just say, God, just speak to my heart today. Lord, we're all different places in the journey, the journey of discovering you, but in the journey of life. And some of us today are really struggling. Maybe we're struggling with our emotional world, our mental health, or maybe we're struggling in our our relationships or at work. Some of us are struggling because of lack of purpose and vision in our lives, and we wonder what it's all about. Help us, God. Speak to us today. Open our minds to comprehend and our hearts to receive and respond. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You don't have to kneel before me, Britt. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay, darling. Oh, Max is not happy. Give me back my truck. Give me back my truck. Okay. So praise the Lord. Where do, where do I start? Do I, do I start in the sense of um, if it's a Carlton Collingwood Grand Final, it's going to be feral around here? <laughs> do, I have to, do I have to actually mention that? Praise God. I'm just so excited because of what God's doing, how God is touching people's lives. I, I went and spent some time with people who were doing Alpha, a course called Alpha, which is the ex- exploration of Jesus and discovery of Jesus. I went and spent some time with them yesterday, and, and the Holy Spirit just showed up in power, and people's lives were getting changed and touched, and, and uh, it just reminded me again how much God has a thirst. God has a thirst for you. He has a thirst to impact your life. That you don't have to just go through the motions of life. You don't have to just be religious and be this churchy type person. You can be a fervent follower of Jesus and know that Jesus, by His Holy Spirit, wants to come to impact your life. No matter where you are, no matter what stage of life you're at, whether you're just a newborn baby or whether you're on the other end. God wants to impact your life. So it's about our thirst. You know, the Bible talks about the parable of the sower, where the sower is throwing out the seed, and it found four different types of soil. Same field, four different types of soil. But the seed was exactly the same. The difference was the soil, and the soil is our heart. And we're responsible for our heart. God isn't responsible for our heart. We're responsible for our heart. So as we spend time with Him, as we spend time in and. And just open on our hearts for God to come and to speak to us as we desire Him, as we seek Him, we shall find. As we knock on that door of, of, of discovery, He will open the door. As, as, you, as you have once been blind, He will open your eyes. Suddenly you get glimpses of God's love for you. Suddenly you'll understand no matter what your situation is, no matter what stage of life you're at, that God has something to say to you and how to, He wants to lead you through some things and for some of us some of us feel like we're lost in the forest 
you know, we keep on bumping in the trees. We think it's so dark or whatever. And God is saying, just press into me and I will shine my light. And he will give you a light through the forest, a pathway through the forest. And you can follow him. He has a thirst for you. He has a desire for you. He's not looking for you to play church or just come and sing some songs. He's looking for your heart to be made ready for his seed to come for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I believe that's a prophetic word for many of us this morning. It's not part of my sermon, but I believe God wants to say that to you. There's somebody who's feeling hopeless here today, and God says, there's no hope in your own world. There's only hope in me. Turn your eyes to him. Turn your eyes to him. Hallelujah. Last week I talked about having conversations with people who do not believe in God. People who call themselves atheists or agnostics. And, uh, you know, if they, anybody who asks you, you know, what, what's so different about this, this Jesus that you follow? Who is this Jesus? What's so remarkable about this Jesus that you, that you follow? And um, so last week I kind of started to answer that a little bit. And I had such a great response to it. I thought I'd drill down a little bit more. Drill down a little bit more into what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. The, the topic that I kind of highlighted last week was just the, the, the aspects of power. Because power is such a real thing that we all want power. We might call it control or something else. But, but we all want power. Our, our, our governments want power. Our politicians want power. And we talked about what Jesus' response to power was. And if you're having a conversation with somebody who uh, doesn't believe in God or far away from God, um, to just tell them, oh, well, Jesus is the Son of God. He died for your sins and stuff might not, might not you know, make much difference to a person. So you've got to start to talk to them about in areas in which they're living in. You've got to scratch where their itch is, not where your itch is, Christian. You've got to scratch where their itch is. And everybody kind of wants to understand this thing of power to, to some degree. So we kind of looked at that a little bit. A couple of great questions you might want to start to ask is, is, what would you do if you discovered you had all the power in the universe? And the second one is, and what, if, what would be your first act to demonstrate your power? When you ask a question like that, odds are you're probably going to get an answer that's different to the one that Jesus uh, gave or he actually did. So that's what we started talking about last week. And Jesus, we highlighted in Matthew chapter 5, the most famous sermon that Jesus did. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It goes for three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Scholars say this is the, the greatest religious teaching anywhere ever given in the world. They don't have to be Christians to say that. Just secular people say that sort of stuff. So I encourage you to read it if you haven't. But Jesus paints three scenarios for us. And he paints three scenarios, not just for us, but for the people who are listening to him. So think about the context of the day. The context of the day is that the Jewish nation was living under occupation. They were occupied by the Romans. And the Romans not only oppressed them, but um, they personified everything that the Israelites hated. For instance, the Roman emperor believed he was a god to be worshipped. On top of that, they worshipped a pantheon of gods. The Jewish nation, they just worshipped the, the one God, the one true God. But the, the Romans, they had no respect for the Jews, the Jewish beliefs, temple, or the Jewish God. On top of this, the Romans' culture was a culture that was one of indulgence and immorality. And the cruelty and oppression of others were clear evidence that they were a godless people to the Jews. And whilst they allowed the Jewish nation to preserve the culture and religion, it was only as long as they paid their taxes and remained docile and submissive to the empire. So Israel was in a continuous totalitarian state. So there was no freedom of thought or action. There was just slavery. So Jesus, being a Jew, was born into this. And he was born into a slave nation. So Jesus is growing up. Growing up. We, we try and transport our modern day back into that time, and it was totally different, friends. It wasn't a democracy, it was a totalitarian state. And because of this, the Jews had this overwhelming sense of resentment and powerlessness. And it was eaten away at their soul, and they hated the Jews. And for centuries, they had awaited and lived in hope for their Messiah, their deliverer. 
there. Um, Alexander, as it were, one like King David who would come with power and force and overthrow the Romans and establish um, his rule and kingdom on earth. But what they didn't understand and what many of us don't understand was that whilst Jesus has ultimate power, he's actually fighting a different battle. Jesus didn't come to deliver us from empires or tyrants or governments or politicians or bosses or whatever other outside force you want to put in there. He came, Jesus came, to free us from ourselves. To free us from ourselves. Because the true battle, the true oppression that we face is actually within each one of us. So on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus reveals a different way to access true power. And from verses 38 through 41 there in chapter 5, he basically says this. If anybody slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other cheek. If anyone um, sues you to take your shirt, let him have your coat as well. If one of the occupation troops forces you to carry his pack one mile, carry it two miles. Now, whilst we might just read that and think, oh, that's, that's quaint, for the people listening to Jesus at the time, these scenarios were not hypothetical. He was actually describing challenges that confronted them daily. For instance, the Roman soldiers, whilst they gave us some amazing things, the Roman culture gave us some amazing things, it was also a very violent culture. It was nothing for a Roman, a Roman um, outfit to, to roll into a village and just wipe out our village or just wipe out all the children in the village. It was a very violent culture. And in Israel, the Roman soldiers were very violent and they wanted to express that violence but there was restrictions on them to what they could do if there was no provocation. So what they would do is that to instigate conflict with the Jews, they'd go up to a young Jewish man and they'd slap him in the face, hoping that the Israeli would respond and then the Roman would be able to kill him. So that's what was facing them. It was just another sign of the occupation, another reason that the Jews were looking for the deliverer and for revenge. So Jesus' words and what he's saying here and the response he was instructing them to do was not for a weak person to hear. It was not for a weak person to hear. Jesus is saying to them, when they slap you in the face and attempt to steal your dignity, don't retaliate. Instead, turn the other side of your face and offer it to him. Now, this would have seemed to, seemed to the crowd listening to Jesus, this would have seemed to be absurd. But what Jesus is saying here, and what he's saying to you and I today, is that the only power the soldier has, the only power that the one who's an earthly power has, has the, is the power to diminish you. So when you stand there and offer him the, the, uh, your other cheek, you're communicating to that person, only one of us has been diminished, and it's not me. So Jesus is challenging his followers of that day to not let those who abuse power to steal your identity your dignity, your, your strength, or your freedom. So for us today, 21st century um, Christians in Australia, when people abuse their power, when people abuse their power, do not allow them to steal your dignity, your strength, or your inner freedom. And of course, Jesus not only talked about this, he modeled that on the way to, way to the cross. So here's a guy who had total power, Yet he humbled himself and he turned the other cheek. One of Jesus' greatest acts of strength was sending the message to those who would use the power to end his life that they could not diminish him. He was showing us all that they were powerless to change who he was and how he chose to live. And that we all have that same power as well. Which is what we've seen over the centuries in the followers of Christ who have walked in the ways of Jesus from the early disciples right through to present day. When you, when you look at open doors and you, and you hear about the persecuted church and, and things like that, these people are following the way of Jesus. A guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's one of my kind of heroes, at the end of World War II, when he was about to be executed by the Nazis for his faith, on his way to the gallows, he turned to a, a fellow inmate and he said, they think that this is the end of me, but this is really just the beginning. And with that, he went to his death, showing no fear, just faith. He was doing what Jesus had said, and in doing so, he, like Jesus, was showing those with the power to end his life that they could not diminish him. 
And as I said, Jesus didn't just say this. He lived it. He held the line all the way through his life. And even though he knew what was coming, he didn't change the condition of his life. And because of that, he changed the course of human history. In Jesus' life, he elevated the value and power of kindness and compassion. He integrated holiness with humanitarianism, merging the first commandment with the second commandment, which is love God and love your neighbor. In, in Jesus' teaching, and particularly in this teaching, Jesus is exposing the lie that some people today seem to believe, that you can love God without loving people. It's simply not true, friends. It's an oxymoron. C.S. Lewis says, you cannot love God without loving God's people. That's the way of, of Christ. Then Jesus goes on Matthew 5 to tell um, his audience, if someone wants to sue you and take your, your shirt, you should give them your coat as well. So in our world today, it's like everyone wants to sue somebody for something, chasing the quick dollar, particularly in America. Have you noticed that? It's like you can't look at somebody wrong in America and they're going to sue you. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, but it, and the Christians seem to be as bad as, as everyone else, justifying their actions of non-compliance to, to Jesus' teaching because of other people's injustice towards them. So now it's no longer about achieving justice, but for many it's just about getting money. And many today think social justice, listen to this, many today think social justice is about equality of outcomes instead of what tr social justice truly is, which is equality of opportunities. Did you hear that? Social justice is not about equality of outcomes. It's about equality of opportunities. It's like the world system that we kind of grow up in. It kind of convinces us to see the world as a system of limited resources or limited possibilities. So the philosophy, if you follow this, if you live by this, the philosophy basically is this. Take whatever you can from wh whomever you can, whenever you can. That's the philosophy of the day. It's like as though we're living in this perpetual state of helplessness. And this helplessness creates a poverty of soul. And many of us feel like victims. Friends, when you lose faith that the kingdom of God is like a river with enough to go around for everybody, and you start to think of the kingdom of God like a cake that only has a limited supply, you become convinced that if you're going to get what you deserve, you must take it from somebody else. It's like we think for someone else to succeed, I must fail. For someone else to have, I must go without. You know, in my world, I speak to many pastors, people kind of starting off, and it's like this mentality. You know, if, if I'm going to have a good church and a, and a growing church and stuff, you know, then, then somebody else must fail because the, the kingdom of God is only like a cake. No, the kingdom of God is a river. It's a river of opportunities, a river of resources. Why? Because He is the source of all things. The world system will try and get you trapped into take whatever you can, whenever you can, off whoever you can. Like for you to win, somebody else has got to lose. No, 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 friends. That is the, 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 the philosophy of this day. It is not the philosophy or the ideology of the kingdom. The true fact, friends, is that God has enough for us all. He has enough resource for us all. I often see the opposite of the spirit of the age. You know, like I've known people who have lived in poverty who were incre incredibly generous with the little that they had and experienced the joy and meaning of life far greater than others that I've known who have had much and live with the spirit of lack. I was in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I was there too. Uh, it's Mars, I think. Um, I was in Mexico City. City, it was like there's a lot of people in Mexico City. There's a, there's a city within Mexico City that's um, that's five million people, or at least when I was there, it's probably bigger now, but five million people there who live in abject poverty in the center of Mexico City. In abject poverty. And I was there and I was I was uh, speaking to some people and um, this family, you know, I met this family and uh, they said, Oh, can you come for dinner? And I said, Yeah, so long as you don't put spice in the food. Which is like saying that to a Mexican is just, to no, no spice to them is super hot for us. So my mouth was on fire that night. But anyway, this family had eight people living in two rooms. Mom and dad and six kids. Living in two rooms. They didn't have two bob to put together. 
They had a few chairs on a table. Kids spent most of the time out in the streets in the dust, no shoes, you know, all that sort of stuff. But they treated me like a king. It was actually overwhelming. And, uh, and there was such a spirit of joy, such a spirit of joy. I was overwhelmed by the spirit of abundance and joy. But I've also known the opposite, you know, with people who have amazing abundance, but they live as though they're impoverished. And that's the spirit of lack. It's like these folks live in fear of losing what they have. Friends, if you have a poverty mentality with a spirit of greed, you'll never experience or practice the life of generosity. No, ma- no matter how much money or stuff that you have, your identity is not in your money or your stuff. Your identity isn't earned. Your identity is given to you. And it's given to you by the, the one who loves you. This mentality has nothing to do with your income level. It's got to do with what you're allowed to live and grow inside of you. And the plain truth is, folks, in our society, and it encourages this. See you, Max. Everybody wave goodbye to Max. It was a good effort. It lasted about 10 minutes. Well done, bro. What are you allowing to live and grow inside of you, church? Friends, what are you allowing to live and grow inside of you? For many, it's greed. And this greed is driven either by fear or envy. Greed is driven by fear or envy. For me, it's fear. You know, the thought that I often come about about is, you know, if something happens to me, you know, I need to have enough resources for Danny. Or or when I retire, I've got to have enough resources and and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, But have you noticed, when you follow that, there never seems to be enough. Never seems to be enough. So many of us are in this boat. And, and Jesus is showing us here how to wage war against this in our own lives. He's showing us that greed, which is driven by a combination of envy and fear, is fought with generosity. So he says, if someone tries to take your shirt, confuse them completely and give them your coat as well. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't fight them over meaningless things. Don't fight with them over meaningless things. Rise above them and respond to their greed with a generosity that will confound them. This is amazing, isn't it? But the truth is, you can only give a man your coat if you have an abundance mentality. And when you are convinced that God is always more generous than you, it becomes easier to be generous with what you have. I see this in my wife, Danny. Danny, unfortunately, she sees the opposite in me. It's true, I'm Scottish, what can I say? But just a tip, this is what I found. You know, I'm as tight as they come, particularly when I was growing up. And uh, I come to this thing called faith, and I talked about giving and all this sort of stuff. It went in one ear and out the other. I just continued to live my own life, gathering and gathering and gathering, and yet I never seemed to ever have enough. So I, I prayed one day, God, you need to help me in this area. I need the gift of generosity, and God gave me Danny. <laughs> And uh, she's been growing me ever since. (laughs) Praise God. The first place that I found helpful in my fight in overcoming greed in my life is being generous firstly towards God and His work. And And I'm generous firstly towards God and His work through my tithing. The first thing that comes out of my wage packet is my tithe to God. It's my giving to God. And I've found that through doing that, that he orders my inner world, and then I'm able to give to others. Not as much as Danny, but, you know, I'm getting better. But this is how to find freedom to be generous towards others. So the final scenario in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount deals directly with the rules of Roman oppression. So a Roman soldier could uh, demand a Hebrew man to carry their pack, which weighed up to about 32 kilos, for up to a mile. And because the Roman roads had markers, it was easy to know when the obligation was fulfilled. And if a Jew refused to submit to the demand, he would be flogged and beaten. So it was only ca- after carrying it a mile, or the pack a mile, that the Jew was free to leave. So just think about this. You don't want to do this. You hate these guys. The, and, and they come along and they say, you've got to carry my pack. And they stick it on your back. And you know if you don't, you've got to get beaten senseless. 
So they put it on your back, and you've got to walk with that guy's pack while he's just meandering along beside you, maybe calling you a few choice names, and you're carrying. And you just throw that marker, and every step, this humiliation is deeper. Every step, you're thinking, oh, an eye for an eye. One day, one day, Roman, you're going to get yours. The first mile carrying the pack, the second mile walking home. And every step would carry him deeper into an overwhelming sense of powerlessness. The journey was a continual reminder that his life was not his own. The journey was a continual reminder that his life was not his own and he, that he was not free to choose his own steps. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever been in that place of obligation? You've, you've had to do this? Maybe it's a, a, a place of humiliation for you that you've had to do this. Something you've hated to do. Something you haven't wanted to do. You know, like this, this person's a pain in the ass. It's like, I just, I just don't want to do anything. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, you know what I mean. Ass is a donkey. You know, you've got to care for your donkey. <laughs> that was funny. Come on, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Please don't send me any emails. <laughs> but have you ever been there? Seriously, have you ever been there? That place of humiliation, that place whereby you, you didn't like this person and, didn't, and you still you felt obligated to do this thing to help this person or whatever. So what does Jesus say to that? Jesus gives you a new pathway. He gives you a pathway to freedom. He said when they, the man that you that you carry the pack for one mile, carry it too. In other words, well, this is what Jesus said. Just when they think they've broken you by making you walk a mile out of obligation, then go a second mile. Take the power back. Take the power back. Be intentional. Live a life of intention, not a life of obligation. Be intentional. You choose. And just like humility is always more powerful than arrogance and generosity is, almost more, is always more um, powerful than greed, intentional servanthood is the singular power that can overcome obligation. Obligation is actually a false power, whereas intentionality gives you back the power. So Jesus is showing us that it's intention which is the power that elevates you to your highest freedom. He's saying, friend, always do more than what's required. Always do more than what your boss requires. You might have to show up on time, but you can always show up earlier. You might have to pay your taxes legally, but you can, you can always be more generous. Always do more than what's expected. Can you imagine on, in that day and age, you know, you're, you're there as a Jewish man and you're carrying this pack. And, and then you get to the end of this, this mile because they've got these markers. The Roman roads had these markers so you knew when the obligation was fulfilled. And the Roman's about to take his pack back. And then you turn to him and you say, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm not tired and you're clearly not doing well. I'll just go another mile. Can you imagine what that Roman would do then? What the heck? Can you imagine what's happening in you, slave? When your life is being dictated by obligation and suddenly... You're taking power back. You're living a life of intention. A life of intention. That's the power Jesus gives us. The brilliance of Jesus. He turns everything upside down. He's showing us that the power that is unseen is always greater than the power that needs to be seen. Just think of a wave in the ocean. You know, the seen part is never more powerful than the, the part underneath for, for a wave. So to go back where we started with those two questions, what would you do if you found out you had all the power in the universe? And what would your, your first act to demonstrate that power be? What would it be for you? Well, John tells us that's exactly the position Jesus found himself in near the end of his ministry in John chapter 13. All authority and power had been given to him. And knowing that, knowing that, Jesus ties a towel around his waist. He grabs a water basin and he takes a knee. All the power. 
grabs a towel and he wraps it around his waist and he took a knee. He took the position of a servant. And in so doing, he established the new ethic for living and for that matter, for leadership. That to lead is to become the servant of all. That's why we have this current expectation in our society that our politicians and those in power um, should be serving us. The le- leadership is servanthood. The power should not be used to control but to create. But Jesus did even more than that with his power. He then chose to die for those who would choose to kill him. He then chose to remain faithful to those who would betray him. He then chose to offer forgiveness to those who would only offer him condemnation. He chose to heal the sick even though it meant that he would forever carry the wounds of his execution. He then chose to tie a towel around his waist and to serve those who would later claim to have no ties with him. Why? Because he was free. Why? Because he had the power. Why? Because he wasn't dictated by the philosophy of the day. Friends, to save the world in this way, it cost Jesus everything. To save your life, it cost Jesus everything. But again, freedom and victory for you and for me and for us all if we would just accept his gift and walk in the way of Jesus. And whilst on the cross he may have looked powerless, yet the world had never seen such a demonstration of power. And this Christian, Christian, hear me this morning. This is the Jesus you follow. And this is what makes Jesus so remarkable. He turns everything upside down. And and we can't, we can't, can't fathom it. It doesn't make sense to us. But when you live it, you experience it. You experience the spiritual life. You experience the newness of life as you give your all. And friends, you need to give your all. You know, some people I've talked to traveling around, I talk to people and they they think it's just about a two-minute prayer out the front. They think, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, I surrender my life, but I just want to hold on. I just want to hold on to my video games. I just want to hold on to my TV. I just want to hold on to my pornography. I just want to hold on to my my insatiable eating habits. I just want to hold on to all these things. And friends, when you come to Christ, you need to die. You need to die to all that. And that's your choice. You choose to die, but then you choose to die every day. And then he will fill you with his power from the inside out. An upside down power. And you'll never know freedom like it. That you're no longer trapped. You're no longer trapped. And that's why you can be confident in every conversation you have. Because Jesus truly is remarkable. He showed us that if we ever want to know the power of God, friends, listen to this. If you ever want to know the power of God, you must first fully embrace the heart of God. So many people are just chasing the hand of God. God, show me your power. Heal this sickness. Provide this this need that I have. Give me a husband or a wife. Whatever it is. You just, we're just chasing his hand. And, and Jesus says, if you want to know the power of God, of God. If you want to know true power, you must first chase the heart of God. You chase the heart of God. Fully embrace the heart of God. If you want to know the power, you see there are no feet too dirty for God to wash. There, no, there is no life too broken for God to heal. There is no soul too dark for God to forgive. And this is the God you follow. And all you have to do is choose. Choose by faith to follow in the way of Jesus, living by his spirit, his values, his ethics, his words as your guide in light. And when you do, friends, when you do, you can live free. Not driven by your hormones. Not driven by your sati- the, those desires that you try to satiate that never get satiated. Aren't you tired of that? Aren't you tired of living all that stuff? Aren't you tired of being dictated by by things around you? Image control. Aren't you tired of that stuff? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So I invite you to come. As we partake in communion this morning, I invite you to come. And when you come and take communion, you just have a time with God. Say, God, I just want to surrender it all. I want to walk in your way. Because this day, I choose to follow you. I choose to follow you in your way. Why don't we just bow our heads in prayer? Father, I thank you for your love. 
I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness. I thank you, Lord God, for the, the amazing, the amazing secrets of life that you give us. Oh, God, who are we? Who are we that you've allowed us to see this? Who are we that you have called us? Who are we that, that we are privileged to step into this place? And then you tell us, you tell us, I have created you uniquely. I have named you and called you. I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. I have always known you. I'm just waiting for you to turn back and to follow. Father, I pray for every one of us that we would follow you wholeheartedly. Lord, when we're in the supermarket and we're in a rush and somebody cuts in on the queue in front of us, that we would turn the other cheek. Lord, I pray that when we're at work and we've been working hard and doing the extra, yet somebody else gets the promotion, Lord God, that we would just give them the coat as well. That we'd encourage them. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. That when we're feeling abused or used and living a life of obligation, that we take back control and then we do more than what's expected because of him who lives in us. His name is Jesus. And through that, other people would see this Jesus and we'd be able to have these kind of conversations and lead them back to you, Father. Lord, as we were taking communion, we ask that you would yeah, speak to our hearts. And friends, the Bible says, before you take communion, examine your heart. So examine your heart right now, friend. Is there anything between you and God? Maybe it's words or actions or attitudes. Maybe it's non-action on some stuff you know you should have done. Examine your heart. And if, if there is, the Bible says, confess your sins. And he, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive you and cleanse you. Just do that right now. Ready? Uh, I just got a, a, a prompt from the Spirit. If this word is spoken to you in any way, I just want you to stand where you are. I just want, I think God wants me to pray for you. So if anything in this word is, is spoken to you, don't worry about those people around you. If something's spoken to you, you just stand. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray. God, thank you, Jesus. And for you folks that are standing, just have your hands open as though you're going to receive a gift. God. I pray for the gift of empowerment of Jesus' power in each one of these good folks standing. Lord, I know for all of us at different times you speak different ways. And today you've spoken to these good people. So Holy Spirit, come. And you folks that are standing, you just you talk to Jesus about why you're standing. You have your prayer with Jesus. Spirit, I pray you come. Come, Holy Spirit, upon each one of these good folks. Lord God, continue to quicken your word to them and seal it through communion, Father. Why don't we all stand together? <laughs>